grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ, who is Emmanuel, who has come to us. Amen. Well, as of Thursday, January 5th, Christmas is officially over. Are all the decorations down at your house? You already took care of all that? They're still up at my house. Yeah. Have you settled back into the routine after the Christmas break? I know that can be difficult for some. Here at St. Mark, every year after the craziest, uh, the craziness of Christmas, I give the staff and myself a, about a week break to relax and recoup and refresh and hopefully refocus. But I have to admit, I have always found vacations to be a double-edged sword. And here's what I mean by that. There's a lot of work and preparation that goes into getting ready to go on vacation. All the work you have to get done ahead of time so it's not bothering you while you're supposed to be relaxing. And especially if you're going out of town for a trip, that's a whole another list of to-dos and stress that is the one side of the double-edged sword, getting ready to relax. And then when you're on vacation, hopefully everything goes wonderful. Nothing interrupts your plans and uh, adds more stress to it. And even if all of that goes like you wanted it, then there's the other side of the double-edged sword. Everything you have to do when you get back from vacation. Everything to get ready to get back into the routine of everyday life. God created us in part to be creatures of routine. Not only did he create the cycle of light and darkness, night and day, but God also created the seasons in which we live. And he created the routine of worship by setting apart the Sabbath and making it holy every week. Even after the fall, and one could probably say because of the fall into sin, we can look at the books of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers and see the deep and meaningful routine of worship that God intended Israel to live in. We find great comfort in routine, not just because we're Lutheran, <laughs> but because there's predictability in routine. And we like predictability as humans. We like that feeling of knowing what's coming Routine gives us the perception, at least, of control. But while God certainly created us in part for routine, and that's a gift from him, God did not create us for routine. If the story of Christmas and how God himself came to dwell with us and what that teaches us about our experience of Emmanuel, God dwelling with us, it should teach us that God's ways are very often unpredictable, that his intervening into our lives very often disrupts our routines, those routines we create to try and control our lives. In Matthew chapter 2, we find Mary and Joseph in the routine of everyday life. It's been quite some time since Jesus has been circumcised that we read about last week when he was brought to the temple and Simeon held him in his hands, the 40-day-old baby at that point. Now Jesus, who's about two years old, with Mary and Joseph, are living in Bethlehem, the city of David where King David was born and anointed. And there's no reason to think that Mary and Joseph weren't doing everything that any other young parents do day to day, desperately trying to achieve routine. That is, until their routine, everyday life was rudely interrupted by three wise kings. Well, the Bible never says they were kings, so I guess we could say that Mary and Joseph's life was interrupted by three wise guys. But then again, uh, we're not told that there were three. There were likely a whole lot more. And while we're at it, how wise do we think these wise men really were, after all? I mean, based on some of their actions, one might begin to question their wisdom. The reputation of King Herod was not a secret Herod was a ruthless megalomaniac who was obsessed with himself and with his power. 
And as is usually the case with such narcissists, Herod was profoundly paranoid. It was common knowledge at this point that Herod had not only put his uh, perceived threats to power to death by the sword, but he even killed his sons in his paranoia because he thought they were going to steal the crown from him. This was no secret. This is why Matthew tells us in verse 3 that when Herod the king heard about this king of the Jews being born, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Another way of saying it was, if Herod's troubled, you're troubled. So then if Herod was so widely known as a murderous tyrant who killed any threat to power, why would the wise men walk straight into Bethlehem and say, hey, we're here to find the new king and we're not here to worship you, King Herod? Not only that, but if the wise men had their way, they would have waltzed right back to Herod after worshiping the child Jesus and told him exactly where Jesus was. Given the circumstances and what we know historically about the Magi, the wise men, it'd be difficult to conclude that they were completely ignorant of what Herod's response would be. So then why, if they came to worship a king, would they do so in such a way that put him in danger? Well, we could speculate all day as to why the wise men did such an unwise thing, but that's not the point of the text. What is the point of this text is that God intervened, that God interrupted the plans. He interrupted the wisdom of men for the sake of saving mankind. Matthew tells us in verse 12 that after the wise men fell to their knees and worshipped Jesus and gave him their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, they would have gone back to Herod and revealed Jesus' location, but being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. These wise men very well may have been wise in their own eyes and maybe even wise according to other people. But clearly we see in their actions that knowledge is not the same as wisdom. In fact, you could say it was what these wise men knew that put the life of the king in jeopardy. Nevertheless, I would still say that these men were, in fact, wise. They were not wise because they knew some Hebrew scriptures or that they studied the stars or that they were good scientists. No, they were wise because they walked according to the word of God that came to them. Even if they didn't fully understand it, they walked according to the word that was revealed to them. Though we don't know exactly which prophecy of Scripture originally informed them that the Messiah of the Jews would come with a star, there were certainly plenty to choose from. You have Numbers 24 that said, I see him now, or I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Maybe that's what originally turned them on to the star and the connection with the Messiah. Or maybe it was another passage that was way more detailed, even talking about men coming from afar and the exact gifts they would bring. Isaiah chapter 60 says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness the peoples, but the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be carried on the hip. They shall bring gold and frankincense, and shall bring good news to the praises of the Lord. Even if it was in complete ignorance... Even if they did so, not really understanding at all what the text they were reading meant, the wise men followed the word of God that was revealed to them. And as the word of God always does, it revealed to these men salvation. It brought them to Jesus. Did the wise men find and follow the star because they figured it all out with their telescopes and compass? No. 
They had no special understanding or wisdom of their own, lest we forget that when they got to Israel, Jerusalem, they had to ask where he was going to be born. They didn't have it all figured out. These wise men didn't come because their learning led them to Christ. They came because God first revealed himself to them. And it wasn't first through a star. It was through his word. His word that casts the light of Christ into the darkened hearts of men. No wonder Matthew says in verse 1 of our text, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, behold, Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? That's a great word in the Greek, behold, idu. It's fun to say, at least. And every time Matthew uses it, it's connected with a revelatory aspect of who Jesus is. And when Matthew says these wise men came, he says, Whoa, look at that. In a very real and appropriate sense, OMG. Oh my God, look what God has done. No one expected wise men from the east to show up to this child's home knowing that he is in fact the Jewish Messiah. Look what God has done. Through his word, even to a Gentile heart, he has revealed his salvation in Christ. Psalm 119 says, Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. And that was not only true for the Gentile wise men, as we see in this story, that was true for Mary and Joseph too. Their whole lives were turned upside down that day when the angel Gabriel came and said, Well, uh, you're going to have a son, and he is the Son of God. And for that period of time, I'm sure everything seemed crazy. And at least for the past two years, they finally had a chance to just settle down into a routine until yet again, the word of God intervenes. And this time it's not with a message of great joy, but with the news of great trouble, great fear because of Herod. It's a message to Joseph to run fast and to run far. Three times God came to Joseph in a dream. Verse 13, rise, take your child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. Can you imagine if that happened in modern day? Say you're home getting ready, trying to put the kids to bed or make dinner and the Lord comes to you and says, pack up now, leave now and drive as fast as you can. Where? Egypt. How long? I'll let you know. Then finally, after the wait in Egypt was over, in verse 20, the second dream comes to Joseph, and he says, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And can you imagine the relief that must have fell upon them? We get to go back home. Well, that is until God intervenes yet again in verse 22. But when he had heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, Joseph was afraid to go there, and being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. See the pattern there? God intervenes with his word. And as astonishing, as unbelievable as it might have been, Joseph went. I can assure you he didn't understand. The text tells us he was terrified. But the word intervened, and Joseph followed. Though God's intervening through his word certainly ruined the routine of Mary and Joseph's life and resulted in fear, uncertainty, even hardships, God intervened into routine to bring about salvation through his word made flesh. Jesus, who was born to die, but at least for right now had to live so that at the right time he would die and bring salvation for the whole world and especially for those holy innocent children that were murdered for his sake, those first martyrs of the church. When God intervened into the lives of people like the wise men and Mary and Joseph, who 
received the word into their life, into the routine with faith, then what was revealed to them was life and salvation, even through pain, even through suffering. The word revealed life even through death. But for those like Herod and the scribes and priests who rejected the intervening word, there was only suffering, only death. Epiphany is still happening today, even this day as the word comes to you now, as the word of God comes and desires to intervene in your life, to intervene into the routines that we have established. God promises that when we live faithfully in his word and walk according to it, he will lead us to the exceeding joy of salvation, even if it comes through times of uncertainty, even if that word reveals to us the joy of salvation through fear or trials or suffering. When the wise men finally laid eyes on the Christ child, Matthew tells us they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy, and, and that's why God intervenes into our life, even messing things up sometimes because he desires what's best for us, something only he can know, something only he can see. God has intervened in your life, my friends. Emmanuel has come. The word is with you not only in your heart but even in your hands. I pray that you hear that word and that word of God that is the power of salvation would guide you and lead you in your life now and into eternity. And so I pray that God would grant us to walk faithfully in his word and allow him to intervene into our life because he has come, he is here, and he gives us his word today so that we would rejoice exceedingly both now and forever. Amen.